invitation and thanks for having me your class, especially as I'm not an economist, that will rapidly become clear. <laughs> um, so when Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winner from, uh, in economics from the University of Chicago died, the American media proclaimed that he was the greatest conservative economist of his generation. The rest of the world, in their media, said Milton Friedman was the greatest liberal economist of his generation. And that's the paradox. The paradox is, is that American, when Americans use the word liberalism, they mean something different from what liberalism means in the rest of the world. To put it crudely to begin with, American liberalism is associated with a more activist, interventionist view on the economy. Liberalism in the rest of the world is referred to people who are more in favor of free markets and less interventionism. So uh, the subtitle of my talk is How the Americans Destroyed the English Language Again. <laughs> So what I want to do is, in three parts, I want to explain how did this happen? How did this uh, liberalism come to mean something different in the United States than it did in the rest of the world? Secondly, I want to identify what these differences are. Thirdly, particularly because of the international uh, students here, talk about how this is reflected, for example, in discussions in Latin America, which otherwise can be seen a little odd from an American point. And then open it up for questions and discussion. And I would be happy in that to obviously take any questions you have to have. But we might also want to discuss what is the merits of American liberalism versus the other type of liberalism. So that's what I that's what I want to do. So as I said, if anybody's got a handout, I'm roughly going to follow what it is uh, as set out here. So I think that liberalism, whatever it is, has certain common characteristics. I think the dominant characteristic of liberalism is the belief that the freedom of the individual is the primary, the most important political value. And I want to emphasize the political value. It doesn't mean it's the most valuable thing in your life. For most people, it's things like family, or religion, or their jobs, or their family. It's a statement about what's the most important political value, the freedom of the individual. That is the standard by which liberals should judge whether a government action is a good one or a bad one. I'm, because of the economics nature of this class, I'm going to talk about the economics element to it, but anybody who wants to talk about the foreign policy elements to it, of course at the moment that's a pretty interesting question, or to look at the social policy Question, for example, to do with drug legalization. I'd be happy to take that, but my focus here is going to be on the economic aspects of it. Now, I think liberalism, whatever its form, has certain key features. The first one is individualistic. That is, it's the primary, the primacy of the individual over the collective. So the individual should not be sacrificed to the group, to the collective, to the nation. The second characteristic is that liberalism is egalitarian. And here I have to warn you that nowadays, when we hear the word egalitarian, we think of it almost exclusively in terms of economic equality, economic distribution. That is not, I think, the primary understanding how liberals have viewed it. What they mean by being egalitarian is that all human beings have moral value, have moral status. So for example, liberals have been very much in favor of extending rights to women, for example, or to African Americans that have been denied to them. So the, the idea that the, all human beings we should take into account when we're making decisions. Thirdly, they're internationalist, that they're primarily interested in looking at the, 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 the whole world, the moral unity of the human species, if you like, they're not particularly directed at the interests of a particular nation, or a particular ethnic group, or a particular part of the country. 
they try and view, whether they always do it is another question, but they try and view things in a more internationalist perspective. And the fourth characteristic, I think, of all the liberals is that they are meliorist. And what we mean by that is, is that liberals believe that you can improve the world, but there's a limit to how much you can improve the world. If I give you an example of Stephen Pinker, who's a Harvard psychologist, he wrote a very good book called The Blank Slate, where he said the human mind is not a blank slate. We can't do whatever we want. There are limits to how we can change society. There are basic features of human nature, which is why he said we cannot create a utopian society. But his more recent book on the better angels of our nature, he talks about how today the world is so much more peaceful than it was in the past. And he attributes that largely to certain features of enlightenment liberalism. So things can get better, but there's a limit to how far. We shouldn't exaggerate the ability of how to train, transform the world. So I think these are some key features of liberalism in general. Now in the 19th century, there was a consensus about what liberalism meant. There was no disagreement. It was associated with people like Adam Smith, with the Scottish Enlightenment, with the first so-called liberal international economic order. How do we create a world where there are no barriers to, to trade uh, between people? There was a consensus about what this meant. So when a 19th century person used the word liberal, they meant things like this. Laissez-faire, leave us alone, get the government out of interfering in, in business. Free trade, we should treat people the same uh, in terms of exchanging goods and services if they're in a foreign country as if they are domestically. We should be distinguished between those two things. So the tree, tree, trade should be free throughout the world. Democracy as a check on power. So 19th century liberals did not have a great deal of faith in democracy, that if you just took a majority vote, good things would be decided. That was not, they were very skeptical in that sense. They didn't believe in democracy as simply what the majority wanted. They often talked about democracy should be about majority rule and minority rights. But they tended to advocate democracy because they thought that would act as more constraint on the power of the rulers, whoever they might be. The voters would at least stop uh, rulers from doing the really, really bad things. Definitely. Moral liberty, what I mean, what they meant in this context is things like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, that there should be no constraints by the government <coughs> on these behaviours. And sixth, a distrust of government. A suspicion that government was not something that you should trust. That every government had the potential to be tyrannical in nature. We see this, for example, in the Federalist Papers, in, in, in the support of the US Constitution. It's full of concern about it making sure that, yes, we want to have a national government, but we want to make sure it doesn't have too much power. How do we put checks and balances on the power of the federal government? So there's a broad consensus among liberals in the 19th century. The big debate between the liberals at that time was between utilitarians, those who thought that you can in some sense measure happiness in some way, that should be the criteria, the greatest happiness of the greatest number, a phrase used by Jeremy Bentham. And those of you who study economics will be familiar with this concept of utility maximization that economists use, even if they don't use it correctly always. That's not question. So on the one side, you have those who are concerned with utilitarianism, the consequences of policies for happiness was the standard by which you should judge government action. And on the other side, you have people in favor of natural rights. They argued that there were certain basic natural rights that everyone had, 
that that should be the criteria for deciding government action. And of course, we see that expressed in the Declaration of Independence, where we talk our natural inalienable rights uh, to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I'm not saying that all liberals agreed with everything in the 19th century, but that tended to be the focus of the conflict, utilitarians versus natural rights. And I would include in this group about people of, uh, the, of liberals of the 19th century, John Stuart Mill. He's probably most famous, probably because it's a short book from On Liberty, which talks about that the criteria for deciding uh, government, act, government action should be the harm principle. People should be able to do whatever they want, as long as they do not harm others. In the current context, people tend to think use the harm principle almost exclusively in the context of social issues. For example, uh, drug legalization or a gay sex, for example, should, should be allowed. But Mill didn't use this only in the context of these social issues. He also thought the harm principle applied in the economic realm as well. So he was in favor of social liberty, but also in favor of economic liberty. So on the whole, he's a good guy from the liberal point of view of the 19th century. But I think he did one really <coughs> horrible, horrible thing. It is about the principles of the political economy. He argued that there was a clear distinction to be made between the production of goods and services on one side and the distribution of goods and services on the other. He saw them as two entirely separate questions. Whereas classical liberals, I think, would argue that there is a relationship between these two things. If, for example, you redistribute from rich and poor to poor, from rich people to poor people, that will have an impact on the incentives of richer people to produce. So the more redistribution you have, classical liberals would say, the less production you're going to have, the less wealth you're going to produce. So on the whole, Mill was a, was a classic, a classic, classical liberal, but he did introduce this like naughty, naughty little thing, which I think opened up a can of worms for liberalism as it was then understood. And that can of worms, I think, can be identified at the end of the 19th century with what I would call welfare liberalism. Around about 1890, and I would say dominated to 1980. So this, uh, this new liberalism, this welfare liberalism, came under a wide range of different names. At the time, it was often called new liberalism, sometimes called revisionist liberalism, but liberalism has always been revised. I'm not sure that's terribly helpful. Uh, it's sometimes described in Europe as social liberalism. But I think social liberalism in most American minds is about, you know, should you be able to take drugs or smoke or whatever? That's not what it meant in, in used in this particular European uh, context here. Modern liberalism, mm. well, is that modern? How long did modern last? Uh, for those of you studying any international political economy, you may have come across the concept of embedded liberalism, which I think is an extremely unhelpful term for it. And then a term used particularly by people who don't like it is left liberalism. But I'm going to use the term welfare liberalism because I think it best sums up what this uh, approach is. It was uh, influenced by Hegel, who Although I've recommended several people to read, Hegel is not one of them. He's not very <laughs> easy to read. Uh, but Hegelianism, as a Brit, I would say often bad things come from the continent. Uh, and this came from, it, from the influence of German Hegelianism on these ideas. Uh, and they had certain uh, features that influenced people like big names of the time, T.H. Green, uh, Bernard Bosenkett, and L.T. Hophouse. And Hophouse is perhaps most famous uh, for introducing the idea of imperialism as being the source of wealth for Western societies, an idea that we now tend to associate with Karl Marx, but in this case, Hophouse, 
especially liberal, was like a proto-Marxist in his analysis of uh, imperialism. Now, what are the main characteristics of this welfare liberalism? Well, first of all, that the individual is the product of the community. The individual, what shapes the individual, the values the individual has, arises from the community in which the individual is based. And if you remember, President Obama, during the election, used the term, make sure I get it right, you didn't build it. He was saying that successful businessmen, they didn't deserve the, 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 their success because of their own achievements. It was because of the society that they were embedded in. So this is the idea that the individual doesn't necessarily deserve all the credit for, for their success. The individual is highly dependent on the community in which that person again, putting a lot more emphasis on the community, whereas liberalism historically putting the emphasis on the individual. Secondly, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. They changed the concept of freedom. They developed what we now call positive freedom. This is the idea of freedom as the ability to do the things that you want, whereas classical liberals had tended to think of freedom as the absence of any constraint. I'll come back to that later. So I think it's a key difference between these two liberals. So what we saw in, in Britain at the end of the 19th century was this, I said, widely called at the time, a new liberalism. And at the same time, we saw in the 19th century, late 19th century, perhaps a little bit later, the beginning of the 20th century in the United States, the rise of what we call progressivism associated with people like Herbert Crowley, the editor of The Nation magazine, John Dewey, who created this philosophy called Pragmatism, with a capital P, uh, and uh, Albert Burrell, I mean, if you've studied any management theory, Albert Burrell was first talked about how the power of managers was supplanting the power of shareholders. So they, the progressives, if you like, taking some of these ideas from uh, the new liberals uh, elsewhere in the UK, but they used the term progressives. They did not describe themselves as liberals. So we still have the situation at the beginning of the, of the 20th century when Americans and the rest of the world had a fairly similar view about what liberalism meant. And I think a big shift occurred with Franklin Roosevelt as president. He was the first major figure in the United States who used liberal in the contemporary understanding of what we mean by the word liberal. So he used liberalism to endorse the New Deal, which, as, as we know, uh, was about increasing the government role in the economy, the uh, government taking responsibility, for employment and stimulating the economy um, as much as possible, that the government had the capacity to create full employment, the government had the capacity to end poverty. And he used the term liberal to describe these ideas, the New Deal ideas. At the same time in the United Kingdom, you saw people like John Maynard Keynes uh, espousing a more interventionist government in the United Kingdom, and you saw Lord Beveridge arguing for the basis of a welfare state. This is the beginning of the concept of the welfare state as we know it in the post war period. So I think it was uh, Roosevelt in the 1930s which led to the shift to this different meaning of the term liberal. So historically termed in the history of the United States, I would say relatively late in the process. But that's how people tend to use the term liberal. Then, around the end of the last century, around about 1980, you saw a revival of classical liberalism, associated intellectually with people like Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winner Friedrich Hayek, Nobel Prize winner Jacob Cannon, Nobel Prize winner, and politically associated 
with people like Ronald Reagan in the United States, Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom. We saw a revival of these classical liberal ideas, which have tended to be uh, overshadowed by um, this American style liberalism. And again, to make things confusing, academics can't use the same word. Every academic can't use the same word to describe the same thing, so they have to have some other terms for it. So some people describe it as classical liberalism, a revival of the ideas of the 19th century. Some people use the term neoliberalism or new liberalism. Probably today, uh, most Americans might be closely associated with the term libertarianism, uh, particularly associated now uh, with people like uh, Rand Paul uh, in American politics. Um, to make it more confusing, in the United States, uh, they use the term neoliberalism not to mean <laughs> Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. In the United States, the term neoliberalism was used to apply to Bill Clinton and the, for want of a better term, centrist wing of the Democrat Party, known as the, the DLC, the Democrat Party. So there was a, a shift within the Democrat Party under Bill Clinton to a more center-right position, and Americans used the term neoliberal to describe this, which again is not the same thing as neoliberal as you talk about it in the rest of the world. So I've tried to describe up to now how did this process happen, this emergence of liberalism meaning something different in the United States than in the rest of the world. The next thing I want to do, and this is really, I explain some very complicated ideas and some very basic themes, is can I, I'm try, now I'm trying to contrast what's the difference between this classical liberalism, or liberalism as understood in the rest of the world, and this welfare liberalism, liberalism as understood in the United States. And I want to suggest there's some sort of key differences that you can identify. The first one, I think that one of the most important, is what is meant by freedom. Now, the classical liberal conception of freedom is nobody interferes with your life, the non-interference principle, or the absence of coercion is seen as what is meant by freedom. Uh, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, uh, the terms often used for negative liberty coming from uh, a philosopher called Isaiah Berlin he used the term negative liberty, although it's actually in favor of it, but normally when you go to the negative, you think, oh, that's a bad thing. He thought it's a good thing, this negative liberty. Uh, so that's about not interfering in people. But American liberals tend to view liberty in a different sense. They tend to view it in terms of your ability to do something. So the classic example is, is a poor person free? classical sense, as long as somebody is not forcibly keeping them down, preventing them from doing what they want to do, they're free, they may not be happy, we may want to do something about their condition, but they're still free by, de by definition. Whereas a welfare liberal would say, no, they're not free because they're not able to live the sort of life that they want to do. So this is two very different conceptions about what is freedom. Is it people not interfering in your life? Or is it your ability to achieve the things that you want to achieve? Negative liberty, positive liberty. The second disagreement, I think, is whether government <coughs> is essentially coercive in nature. That is, is whether it's based on force, whether that's the essential nature of government. Or is government primarily a liberating factor that liberates people? So the classical liberals would say, what's the difference between government and any other social institution? The difference between government and any other social institution is that government claims, to use a classic definition of the state from that paper, a monopoly of the legitimate use of force. A monopoly of the legitimate use of force. If somebody came along to you and said, I'm going to take 25% of your wealth, income, I should say, intact. I'm going to take 25% of your income, take it away. If you don't give it to me, I'm going to put you in a cage. We would call that person, quote, 
a criminal. But the government comes along and says, you have to give me 25% of your income. If you don't, I'm going to put you in prison. Um, they no longer a criminal. So the crucial nature of the state, according to a classic of liberal, is this question that the government says, we have a right to use force against our citizens that we would not give to anyone else. So it's coercive nature, it's the ability to claim it's all right for us to use force is the essential nature of the state. So classic liberals would say, whoa, you know, that's coercive, that's not a very good thing, let's try and limit it, make sure they only use it when they have to. Whereas a welfare liberal, they see government as having a liberating force. They can help people in life. They enable people to live better lives. So instead of something that needs to be constrained, they see it as something that we should encourage, that can actually improve or liberate people's lives. Third difference is on the question of private property. Classical liberals say that private property is a fundamental right. I do suggest one thing you might want to have to do if you care about human rights, you might want to look at the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Because it mentions as a fundamental human right the right to private property. And yet, when do you ever hear, when people talk about human rights, when do you ever hear them talking about property rights? You don't. So the classical liberals would say, private property is a fundamental human right that you should threaten only in the most extreme circumstances. Whereas welfare liberals would say, yeah, we're not against property rights, but it's one right amongst many others. We're not going to prioritize it amongst other rights. So let's give the example of eminent domain. This is the idea that the government can take away people's property if they think it will be for the public good in some sense. And many of you may remember uh, a famous Supreme Court case, Chilo, uh, where somebody's house was taken by the by a local authority to give to a company, I think maybe Pfizer, I remember, a major company for their private development, which they claim, the, the authorities claimed, well, if we allow this co company to uh, exist, to build on this property, we'll get a lot more taxes for our local authorities. And so the big debate was, is this a good enough reason to take somebody's private property away? The Supreme Court said, yes it is. Opinion polls among Americans show that overwhelmingly 70 odd percent thought that it was not a justification. So, this is another fundamental difference. Is property right a fundamental right which you should only take away from very extreme circumstances? Or is it simply one right to make some others? You may want to make a trade off against property rights against other things you think are important. <coughs> Fourth difference free markets versus interventionism. So the classic, classical liberals tend to favor <coughs> leaving things to the free market, that for all its weaknesses, uh, all its market failures, it's the best economic system that you can have. While welfare liberals tend to favor a more interventionist type policy. There are ways, they argue, that we can intervene in the economy to make things uh, better. Fifth difference, welfare community or welfare state. So classical liberals would tend to emphasize that we do have an obligation to the poor and the weak in our society. But this is an obligation that we should take on as individuals. We should care about our next door neighbor. Uh, we should care about them through civil society, through charitable organizations through donating or working through organizations. In America, particularly religious organizations, very active on this idea. So we have a welfare responsibility, but it's a personal responsibility. Whereas welfare liberals tend to emphasize the welfare state. 
They say it's the state's responsibility to look after the weak uh, in society. Six, what do we mean by justice? Classical liberals, when they think about justice, they think of it as a procedural question. Were the rules fair that led to this conclusion? Whereas social liberals use the language of social justice. What is the distribution that arises as a result of uh, uh, leaving it following the social fair justice rules? So for example, is it just that Miley Cyrus earns millions of millions of dollars? That she's an extremely wealthy woman, even though she's a crap singer. <laughs> now, the classical liberals would say, no, she's entitled to all that money because nobody forced anybody to buy her records or go to her shows. I thought they would need to be forced to, but they don't. They go there voluntarily and buy her products. So the classical liberal would say, whatever we think of Miley Cyrus, she's entitled to be this very wealthy woman. But if you are concerned about, because nobody forced anybody to give the money that she has, but on the social justice, they would say, well, surely it can't be right that we have some people in society who are so wealthy, like Miley Cyrus, and we have lots of very poor people in society. So they tend to think of justice as a question of social justice. How does income and wealth get distributed in society? Is it in some sense fair? Whereas classical liberals, their concern with justice is how did we get to this distribution? If we did it fairly, that's fine. Now that doesn't mean the classical liberals are all support the distribution of income and wealth that exists in the society. So for example, they would be upset with crony capitalists, people who benefit, for example, by being preferred by, benefited from giving contracts, for example, by their political connections. So they're not necessarily justifying the distribution of wealth that exists. They always ask themselves, how did this person get wealthy? Did they do it fairly by following the rules, or were they in some sense corrupt? So a difference about what they mean by justice. A difference about what we mean by equality. So for classical liberals, the question for them is equality before the law. Are people treated equally under the procedures of the law? Do we treat men and women the same, black and white the same, gays and straights you might say the same? What we might call the rule of law is the question for them. Equality before the law, treating them equally, both in the laws themselves and how those laws are applied. While for an American liberal, when they think of equality, they're primarily thinking about equality of opportunity. How do we make sure that someone born in a ghetto has an equal opportunity to achieve as someone who's born in a relatively wealthy uh, society? So a difference again about what do we mean by equality. And then the final difference between them is this attitude to government. Is government something that we should be suspicious of? Is government that requires us to be constrained on the government because of its potential for coercion to be tyrannical in nature? Or is government something to be welcomed as something that should have a positive contribution that contributes to the common good. So on one side, suspicion of government, let's find checks and controls, constraints on it. Another saying, no, if we have too many constraints on it, it prevents government from achieving the common good, the national interest, what's good for society as a whole. So here I've given some try some somewhat complicated uh, concepts and we talk more about them if you want to do an A, but what I've tried to do is explain what these differences is between this classical liberalism and welfare liberalism. Now to make it even more complicated, let's go for it. <laughs>
Uh, I want to now look at the debate, for example, in Latin America at the moment. Because the Latin American debate is between, on the one side, neoliberals, and on the other side, populists. And if, if you are trying to understand what's going on in Latin America, you need to understand what these terms mean in the Latin American context. So neoliberalism in Latin America means what I've been talking as classical liberals, people like Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. What neoliberals in Latin America is not the same as American liberals. For neoliberals in Latin America, the main focus is how do we maximize economic growth. And so they would point to things like doing away with government deficits, lowering trade barriers, making it as easy as possible to trade with the rest of the world, privatization of inefficient state enterprises, and deregulating the economy, making it as easy as possible to create a business. So that's what neoliberalism means in a Latin American context. The alternative to that is something called populism. And there's a big debate about what is populism. Some people think that populism is simply a question of a style of politics. A political movement led by charismatic individuals using fiery rhetoric against elites, claiming to act on behalf of the people. So, you see this in Venezuela, for example, or many Latin American countries, this sort of style of politics. Does populism have any substance? Or is it simply about style? Well, here again, America is different. So America had something called a populist movement at the end of the 19th century. Political scientists, when they talk about how the American electorate is divided, they often talk about it in four different groups. They talk about liberals in the American sense, they talk about conservatives, they talk about libertarians, and they also, political scientists, use this term populist and by a populist, they mean somebody who tends to be economically interventionist and socially conservative. That is, you remember, but Governor George Wallace, for example, was somebody who was interventionist in economics, but very socially conservative. In America, that is what populism has tended to mean. But in Latin America, it means something different. The focus for populism in Latin America is redistribution, not so much on growth. So populists in Latin America favor the expansion of government, expand government either through increasing taxes or through borrowing more, through increasing trade barriers, protecting our industries from foreign uh, competition. Nationalization of the major <coughs> industries uh, within your country, take them away, particularly if they're foreign owned. And increasing regulation on business, particularly labor regulation. So in the Latin American context, again, we see a conflict of differences, but using different language than that of the United States. So let me try to conclude by saying that my primary goal today is conceptual clarity. My primary goal is that when you read the word liberal, when you use the word liberal, you know in what sense you are using it, or in what sense the author is using it in the books that you're reading. So for me, that's the most important goal I want to say. However, <laughs> I'm not going to say a leap to that, um, one day I will give up my one-man crusade to win back the true term liberalism from the Americans, <laughs> one day, but not today, I want you not to use the term liberal in this false way again. The best term, I think, to use it in the American context is progressive, and of course many progressives do use that term progressive, so don't use the term liberal, use the term progressive. <coughs>
And the second thing I want to do is to encourage you to think of, well, all these different conceptions of liberalism, which one do I find more convincing? Which is one that's more conducive to my own view of the world? Thanks very much for listening. So I think we've got about 25, 30 minutes for any questions, but I'm also happy to take comments as long as they're not speeches. <laughs> Anything on clarification, for example, when I packed a lot in in a short period of time? Or was everything absolutely crystal clear? So that when a professor gives you a test on it next week, you get a 100% answer. Comments, questions? Oh, uh, between liberty and freedom. That's an interesting. I personally don't think there's any difference between liberty and freedom. I think they're terms for the same thing. I think it's just that you get bored with using the same term, and so you want to use a different one. So I don't think. I think liberty and, and freedom are interchangeable words. The problem is, is that some people are using it in a negative sense of non-interference, and other people are using freedom in this sort of positive sense. You might want to ask Jennifer Baker, that's a philosophy, if she thinks there's a difference between liberty and freedom. But they're philosophers, so they always like to be Yeah? In light of this discussion, how does the term free market socialist fit? Oh, free market socialist. Well, I actually don't think that people use the term free market socialist. What I think is that people use the term market socialist, which is somewhat slightly different. So I think what market socialists uh, uh, realize is that, so coming back, remember I talked about John Stuart Mill making this distinction between production and distribution. So market socialists, I think, are convinced that the market, voluntary exchange of goods and services, is the most efficient way of producing goods and services. It will lead to a market, uh, sorry, the greatest amount of wealth. However, they don't believe that you, because you've created this wealth, you're entitled to keep it. They think that you can take people's wealth and redistribute it to others. So that's the socialist side of what it means. Market, creating wealth. Socialism, redistributing wealth. Uh, if anyone wants to ask me, is Obama a socialist? I could pursue that a little bit more. But I, that's the difference I would say between a market socialist. Production separating from distribution. Welfare and liberal or what? Well, um, see, I know that's a really interesting question about when does a welfare liberal creep over the line <laughs> to being some sort of socialist? Um, the problem is, is, what do you mean? Then you have to think, well, what do we mean by socialism? And I think socialism has <coughs> several characteristics. One of them, I think, is state ownership of the means of production and distribution and exchange. That the state should own the major companies in society. I do not believe that welfare liberals are socialist in that sense of the word. They do not believe that the state should run the economy or run own, I should say, industries. But the second characteristic of, uh, of socialism was this idea of equalization, equal distribution. That we wanted to have people who were roughly equal in terms of income and wealth in society. So I think welfare liberals reject the first, they're sympathetic to the second. And the reason why I wouldn't want to say that, they're, that they are themselves socialist in this context is because I think socialists, uh, in this redistributed sense, believe that the goal should be to have everyone with roughly the same equal income and wealth, which incidentally are two different things, which they often don't distinguish between, but roughly equal. I don't think that most welfare liberals believe that, what, that there should be an equal distribution. What they do believe is that the current distribution of income and wealth 
is socially unjust, and therefore you can justify some degree of redistribution from what you have that the market produces. Now the issue then is, so how much redistribution do you think you can justify? So I, don't, I think there is a distinction between welfare liberal that, than socialist, but I think there are some people who sort of slip over into that sort of narrow band uh, between the two. Yeah. Since the, uh, the way a classic liberal versus the welfare liberal would have toward the subject of intervention in market. Oh, good one. Um, hmm, I think that's really tough. <laughs> Let me say that. Um, So I think the big, I think there is a relationship to them, but I'm not sure that people necessarily coherently follow them. So remember, a classical liberal, for them, the, the primary goal is the freedom of the individual. Why do we create government? We create government to protect our freedom. So you see this classic in the Declaration of Independence. Why do the rebels say we want to create this system? because we wanted it, we created this government, or we invented the government they created, in order to protect the freedom of American citizens. Although I would like to add also non-American citizens living on the territory of the United States. <laughs> that, uh, so classical liberals talk about, it's about, we, the US government exists to protect the, the life, liberty, and property of American citizens. I think welfare liberals tend to say is that they're concerned about this positive freedom that they think people should have. For example, that nobody should be starving in the world. And that it is, it's, it's the, the uh, we can justify uh, the, uh, the role of US government to promote the freedom of people in the rest of the world. So I think that's one of the big differences. That's why I think you find, say, somebody like Hillary Clinton, who's very much an interventionist liberal, welfare liberal, is that she thinks that you can justify using the force of the United States to protect the freedom of non-Americans abroad. Whereas I think classical liberals, or perhaps in this context, we might want to use the term libertarians, they say, yes, it's terrible what's going on in the rest of the world. That is not the function of the US government. As long as there aren't American citizens involved, then the US government should be involved. They're helpful, I think. Yeah? I have a question of uh, talking about classical liberals versus progressives and how they view monetary systems in terms of uh, you know, fiat money versus some sort of precious metal standard and some sort of you know, hybrid in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Sort of how they line up on, on that. Right. So I would say that. The, Classical liberals have a wider variety of views on that. So some of them uh, do believe, for example, the Milton Friedman view, they believe in a Fed, they believe that, they, that, that there should be a Federal Reserve System, but it needs to be following certain strict rules about its behavior. And then you'll find other classical liberals who will say, look, we think government fucks up everything. Why should we think it won't fuck up money? So they would say, in an ideal world, yeah, the Fed would do a, could not do a great job, but in reality, it won't. And they point to the, you know, the vast increase in inflation that's occurred since the Federal Reserve was created, compared to before the Fed uh, was created. Um, and they would say, therefore, we need to find some private means, of it, like, like using commodity, or a higher, we'll talk about the privatization of money, that we have as much money should be allowed to compete with each other, and that would maintain the value of the currencies. Whereas I think welfare liberals, because they have a greater sense of belief that the government can do a good job, that we can all trust the government, that they will be uh, concerned with promoting the common good, that, um, that we can trust that they're to do a good job. Whereas I think all classical liberals say, oh, you need to be careful about them. The only question is, is internal constraints enough? Or is it better to do that than that? Speaking of those rules you're talking about, you know, 
Well, that's obviously the big question, is to what extent, how much discretion should you give to the, uh, to the, the governors of the Federal Reserve Bank? Um, and when they have had discretion, do you think they've done a very good job? Well, so I think most, cla most classical liberals would say they haven't done a particularly good job because <coughs> the primary goal of the Federal Reserve should be maintaining the value of their currency. And what we've seen since the Fed has been created is this incredible rapid decline of the value of the dollar. Well, back to your thing about taxes. You know, well, we pay taxes. Well, we pay taxes in the rest. And so we pay those that we pay us under duress. You know, we put in jail. What's the, what's the crime that they break the rules? Change the rules? And they get it within the rules? You mean, when, you mean if the Fed breaks the rules, what's the, what's the price that they pay? They probably get promoted. <laughs> <laughs> I remember some students where is everything absolutely crystal clear or is it you have no idea what I've been talking about <laughs> yeah I was just curious if you were able to speak on is Rand Paul um, how does he stack up in terms of being consistent with the material as oh. opposed to maybe his talk oh. All right, so, so the question was, how consistent is Rand Paul as a, in this case, libertarian? We use that at the moment, loosely the term of the classical I don't get too bogged down into sort of the immediate politics. Um, I would say that broadly speaking, I would describe him as a libertarian. He tends to prefer the term constitutional conservative. Um, and the question is, is there a difference between the two? So I would say, in terms of being a libertarian, uh, do you believe in leaving things to free market? Yes. Do you believe in trying to avoid foreign interventionism in the rest of the world? Yes. Do you believe in being socially liberal, that people should be allowed to leave the lives that they want to leave? Uh, that's a little bit more doubtful. So, for example, when you ask him things like, what about drug legalization or gay marriage, his, his reaction is not, well, people should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. His reaction is, well, we should leave that to the states to decide. So, so the obvious question is, is that because he's not really a libertarian on the social issues? Or is it that he wants to be the, the presidential candidate for the Republican Party? <laughs> and he thinks there are certain things he would say that would prevent him from doing so. And that's why he prefers this term constitutional conservative. Yeah. What is the view in Europe in general, in the United Kingdom specifically, because that's where you're from, about politicians like Ron Paul or Ann Paul or libertarians? Oh, all right. So the question was, what do people in the United Kingdom uh, and Europe think about all this? That's two very different things. Um, Sorry, think about Rand Paul. But the reason I would immediately say they're two different things is that if you look at a map of the world, the United Kingdom, it looks like it's part of the European continent. <laughs> but when you live in the United Kingdom, people say, oh, I'm going on holiday in Europe. <laughs> so the mentality of Britain is still not really part of this European thing. We only go there because the weather's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> so what do they think about? Well, um, that's a that's a new point. Uh, I just did an interview with, a, with on the BBC Radio Four, and they were sort of raising some questions about uh, about it. So the one, first thing you notice is that people in Britain know now who this Rand Paul is. That they know he's a significant uh, figure, and they're trying to puzzle what exactly would that mean if he did become. President uh, of the United States. I would say that in the United Kingdom, most people are not libertarians, so they probably wouldn't be a big fan of Rand Paul, but there is undoubtedly a substantial number of people who would be sympathetic to what he's trying to do. And there is uh, there are on the Euro continent of Europe, uh, then there are again lots of small pockets of people who really like libertarians. On the whole, I would say most Europeans do not know what you mean 
when you use the word libertarian. So libertarian is a term that we tend to use in the United States. It's one they tend not to use uh, in Europe. So again, I think mainly it's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's probably rational motion. But, it, but is there a name for that concept we call libertarians in there? Sorry? Is there, is there well, a name? Well, I would say in, the, the word liberal often refers to something like that. All classical liberalism is something like that. But it tends to be, um, is that the right terminology I want to use? A, like a more moderate version of it. That's probably the not right, the right term uh, to use in this context. I think one of the things that really strikes you when you, when, uh, you come to the United States, or perhaps even before that, when I studied it as a professor of American politics, is that one big difference you have is that you do have this Declaration of Independence, you do have this US Constitution, where freedom is a major feature of it. That the US government was created to, with a, a list of enumerated powers, these are the powers the, U, the US government has and no more, and a Bill of Rights which is saying these are things that should, the government should never do. Whereas if you compare that with constitutions in Europe, well, first of all, Britain doesn't have one. That's one problem. Uh, it's not entirely true, but we don't have a written, a single written constitution in the same way as the United States and the rest of the country does. So it's difficult for people to refer to this document representing a certain <coughs> set of values. And on the continent, they, these, these, uh, these, the constitutions often, in fact, reflect a more welfare liberal type view. So for example, this may be too obscure, uh, the Portuguese government in the moment is suffering from major deficits. So they try to uh, change the labor contracts of, of civil servants. And the court in Portugal said, no, this is unconstitutional. That there are certain protections of labor contracts in the Portuguese constitution, which would not allow that to happen. How would you distinguish between libertarianism and market anarchism? Oh, so the question is, how would I distinguish between libertarianism and market anarchism? So one way you could do that is you could go to my YouTube, <laughs> Nigel Ashford, <laughs> Schools of Classical Liberalism, uh, which sort of describes the differences between these different types of uh, classical uh, liberal or libertarian, if you want to use that term. So, uh, some of you may immediately think, anarchism? Um, so when we tend to think of anarchism, we tend to think of people who are, well, first of all, we tend to think of people who are going around with bombs. <laughs> the second thing we tend to think about anarchism is that there are people who live together in com communes. So they have collective ownership of the property. We're all going to, we don't want private property, we're all going to live in the <coughs> house where we share property and who's going to do the dishwashing? That's another question. Uh, so they live together in this. But there is a form of anarchism, which you just use the term market anarchism. They often describe themselves as anarcho-capitalists. So these are anarchists who don't believe there should be any form of state, mainly because of its coercive nature that I talked about. But they believe that that society would be based on market principles, that is voluntary exchange of goods and services, but you don't need a state to maintain that. So I would argue that market anarchism, the term you used, or anarcho-capitalism, is one school of libertarian thought. But there's a sort of I would say there's a fairly wide spectrum of different types of classical liberals or libertarianism. And as I said, you can find all five of them if you YouTube and I don't Yeah. Um, I was curious about the idea that neoliberalism in, in many countries is viewed as sort of a like a, a corporate colonialism, oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. and whose job is it to open up markets for you know the capitalists or libertarians or whomever, and and how do we do that? All right, so that's that's a lot of questions. So the, the question there is about is that in Latin America, for example, people uh, who tend to be 
that people see neoliberalism as a form of American economic imperialism. That the only reason that people favor neoliberalism is because they want Americans to come in and buy up all our companies and you know buy our oil and gas and do whatever it is that they want to do. So for many of them see it as that's like Hugo Chavez, for example, in Venezuela, precisely seeing that as this is foreigners buying our companies, we need to stop them from doing so. It should be only owned uh, by, um, by local people, in this case, the state uh, with it. So the question is, how do you, well, is that the question? Who, whose you, job and how? How do, you, how do you change that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, how do we open up those markets and whose job is that? Right, is right. That? So I would say, um, the thing I would point to is a lack of toilet paper in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, at the moment, like in Venezuela, there are lots of restrictions on the ability to trade outside. Uh, toilet paper is usually imported into Venezuela. There is, sorry to raise it, lack of toilet paper in Venezuela because they, there isn't the resources for it to buy it. There are also price controls on how much you can, uh, how, at what price you can sell toilet paper as well as many other sorts of things. So I think that Venezuelans are beginning to understand, and in other countries where there's high degrees of protectionism, they realize that it is, does have an impact on their own lives when you can't allow free trade with countries in the rest of the world. So I would say what's going to make a difference is the sense that uh, your life can be improved to the extent that you can have trade with other people. And I presume those of you who are studying international economics, you'll be familiar with comparative advantage and all the, the benefits that the vast majority of economists think exist um, among, uh, if you allow free trade, uh, but just, uh, we actually show that most voters don't seem to understand that, including incidentally in the United States. Americans tend to have an anti-foreigner bias when it comes to protectionism. So, sorry, you're getting too much, too much detail? Mm, I've wrapped a lot. Um, so, for example, when uh, there's a, a proposal to restrict imports of steel into the United States because it destroys American jobs in the steel industry, Americans tend to think that is a good thing because you're protecting American jobs. That's the jobs that you see saved. As economists will tell you, that if you, if you protect steel, steel prices go up. Every American company which needs to use steel now has to pay more for steel, so their products are more expensive. That means consumers in the United States get less for their money for it. So that means there are fewer jobs outside of the steel industry. So more jobs are destroyed, in this case by protectionism, than are protected by it. But Americans, like most people, they see the scene, the people who are losing their jobs, they don't see the unseen, the people whose jobs were not created because of this protection. Yeah? How would the topic of uh, minimum wage play out in your comparison? Ooh. Does that really help? All right. Now again, because I'm a room for economist, I'm not an economist. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, but I would say that there is a difference here. So the classical liberal would say is that wages are primarily determined by supply and demand. That is what determines wages. What happens when you increase the level of the minimum wage? What you see is that some people are getting a higher wage than they had before. So we see the beneficiaries of it. What we don't tend to see is the people who didn't get a job because their value to the employer isn't as high as the minimum, this new minimum wage. So more people are unemployed as a result of it. And again, you can see there's plenty of evidence for it. Uh, the worst hit are less educated African American young men. They are really, I'm gonna use a swear word, they really do badly <laughs> by increases in the minimum wage. 
But we don't see them. We see the people who benefit from the increase in the minimum wage. We don't see the people who didn't get a job because of the minimum wage. So the classical liberals, that's what they would refer to. They would say, this is bad for employment, particularly for the less skilled people. I think welfare liberals would say, well, no, there's something unfair about expecting somebody to live on a wage below a certain level, the term being used, the living wage. It is unfair that people working in McDonald's or Walmart are earning this relatively low <coughs> level of wages. Therefore, they should be, they should be like, imposed upon them that they should be, have an increase in the minimum wage, or in this case, the living wage, as people would use, would, would say. But I would say, if we're really concerned about jobs, so I would say, as you go, I'm classical liberal, uh, I would say that if you care about increasing jobs, if you care about the poorest people in society and enabling them to get jobs, you should be very, very much against the whole concept of the living wage. Can I be rude and say, people who are fed the living wage they're fine because it makes them feel good, but they're ruining people's lives, and they need to know that. One more. One more? Yeah. Uh, how does socialized medicine fit within oh. how does the United States look? All oh, right. So socialized medicine is the idea that the uh, uh, that in some sense the state should run the, the healthcare system. So the classical liberals would say leave it as far as possible to the market economy uh, through some form of competition through, uh, uh, through insurance systems. So that would be the most effective way of trying to, to deal with this. Welfare liberals would tend to say, no, you can't afford, that you can't allow them to do that. If you have a purely market-based healthcare system, then people, there will be some people who will lose out as a result of that. So we need some form of government uh, intervention in the healthcare system. So some people would say, leave it in private hands to have a highly regulated system, which is actually what we have today. And so we say that's not going to work. You need to go all the way to some form of government uh, run healthcare, because having healthcare is a basic human right, which the government should guarantee. Alright, um, just a couple of housekeeping things real quick. Um, following this, if uh, there's going to be a reception out here in the atrium for members of the Bobcat.